Most people don't even understand that listening is different from hearing. Hearing is a capability. Listening is a skill. It's a skill you can practice and master. And if you do that, you can gain huge advantages in your life because the sad truth is most people don't listen. Welcome to Your Intended Message, the perfect place for leaders and promising professionals who want to convey the intended message for greater success. Every week, we interview experts who address the challenges and best practices to deliver your message effectively. That might be one-to-one, -one, one to few, or one to many. And perhaps the most important conversation, one to self. I'm your host, George Torok. My guest today is Julian Treasure. Here's three facts that I think you should know about him. One, Julian's five TED Talks have been viewed over, wait for it, 150 million times. Oh. Two, how to speak so that people want to listen is the sixth most viewed TED Talk of all time. Be sure to watch that. And three, he lives in Orkney. That's an archipelago off the north coast of Scotland with his partner, four-time world champion martial artist Jane Magendi, and their two daughters, Holly and Sapphire. And if the daughters are also learning martial arts, uh, Julian, be nice to them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always polite, always polite, George. <laughs> Julian Treasure, welcome to your intended message. Thank you so much. Lovely to be here. Uh, delighted to be talking with you. And we're going to examine the topic of listening, which is probably something that most of us don't spend enough time thinking about or even being more conscious about the concept of listening because we're in such a hurry to speak because we think that we will be recognized, we will be successful if only we speak more and say more. However, what have you found to be the reality? Well, I think what you just said is very, very true. You know, the old Epictetus quote of uh, people having two ears and one mouth so that they listen twice as much as they speak. Not true anymore, if it ever was. Um, you know, the hearing is our primary warning sense. For the vast majority of human history, listening has been critical for survival, just as it is with most animals in the world. You listen to, um, to be aware of threats, to, you know, to find food, uh, and for a whole raft of other reasons. But now, I look around in, you know, when I visit cities and I see people cycling with headphones on and I think mm, maybe listening is not as critical to our survival as it once was, or at least people don't think it is, is more the point. So yes, sadly, with the invention of writing only 5,000 years ago, I mean, we've been listening for hundreds of thousands of years, uh, writing has kind of come up on the rails and overtaken as our primary form of communication, particularly with distant communication. Um, now that's changing a little bit with the advent of podcasting. I mean, radio has been strong for a long time, but podcasting in particular has created a bit of a renaissance in the idea of listening to people speaking. Um, but also, not only do we have this imbalance between writing and speaking, there's an imbalance in verbal communication as well. My TED talk on speaking that you mentioned has been seen by at least five times as many people as my TED talk on listening. And a big survey of organizational listening found that organizations were on average devoting at least four times as much energy and money and effort to outbound communication as they were to listening. So we are, it seems, rather keener to be heard than we are to listen, which is not an equation that works very well in the world. You know, I often say, what's the point in free speech if nobody's listening? What's the point in being a brilliant talker if nobody's listening? 
So to me, yeah, listening is the foundational skill of all of our communication. It's primal, it's critical, and yet we seem to have forgotten about it. We don't teach it in school, which is mad when you think about it, because if you taught children first how to listen really well, how much more of their education would they absorb and retain than they do now, where they're struggling in classrooms built by architects who don't listen, uh, the children can't hear very much a, a, a great deal of the time. And if they can hear it, are they actually listening? Not really, because they don't know how to do that. Most people don't even understand that listening is different from hearing. Hearing is a capability. Listening is a skill. It's a skill you can practice and master. And if you do that, you, you can gain huge advantages in your life because the sad truth is most people don't listen. Listening is a skill and skills typically are based on techniques repeated and improved and that takes effort and people don't like putting out effort if they don't have to. Uh, and and it's, it's strange that it takes less effort to speak than it does to listen. I wouldn't say it takes less effort, uh, but the rewards are rather more immediate and obvious, I suppose. Uh, so, you know, a lot of people spend time training on presentation skills or, uh, or speaking skills. Well, I say a lot, actually, when this is the other thing I teach. And it's also quite interesting. You know, I stand on stage, I go around the world doing keynotes to big organizations and associations. And, you know, let's say I'm talking to 500 CEOs. And I say, how many of you use your voice in your work? For how many of you is your voice really important? Presenting, talking to the media, leading teams, all that kind of thing. Everybody puts their hand up. Good. Okay. Now, how many of you have had formal vocal training? About three. And I just think, what is going on here? If your voice is critical to you, that's also a skill. You know, this is the instrument that we all play. And yet very, very few people train on how to use it effectively. Obviously actors do, obviously singers do, but business leaders, the tiny minority of them take the time to develop skills with this incredible instrument. And, you know, the foundation of my work really is that these skills, speaking and listening, have profound effects on three very important things, our happiness, our effectiveness, and our well-being. So, dear listener, if you don't care about any of those three things, don't bother. But if those things are important to you, and I rather suspect they are, it really is worth opening these doors to whole new worlds of capability, skill, and you know, transformed outcomes in those three domains, your happiness, your effectiveness, and your well-being, powerfully affected by how well you speak and how well you listen. And Julian, if you are working with a with corporate leaders and you're helping them to improve their listening skills, where do you start? Well, the first thing to get is that listening is a skill. And, you know, that realization on its own is transformative because before that you're in the don't know what you don't know quadrant, aren't you? If you don't know that you don't know something, there's nothing you can do about it. You're not even aware it's a shortfall. So the moment you say listening is a skill, the moment that's internalized, people say, well, how good am I at it? Have I ever thought about it? What, how can I improve it? And there's a will then to move through conscious incompetence is the next one after unconscious incompetence and then to conscious competence and then to unconscious competence. So that, you know, the stages of learning, we can start on that path as soon as we understand listening is a skill. It's a skill that you can practice and master. So that's the first thing. The second very important thing to understand about listening is that every human being's listening is unique. Now, this makes the whole conversation much more interesting and nuanced. And it's really the access to a huge amount of power in speaking this realization that everyone's listening is unique because 
as soon as you let go of the assumption everyone listens like I do, which is the innate assumption many, many, many people have, and so they are effectively talking to themselves, that's not effective because the person you're talking to doesn't listen like you do. Why? Because we listen through a set of filters, and those filters are things that accumulate through our lives. The culture that we're born into, maybe national, local, familial, whatever it is, the language we learn to speak, the values, attitudes, and beliefs that we accrete along the way from parents, teachers, role models, friends, whoever it is. We pick some up, we put others down. And you will have chosen different ones to me, doubtless, as every human being does. And then in any given situation, we might have expectations or intentions about what's going to happen. We might have assumptions. We will almost certainly have assumptions in our head, not least about what's going on inside somebody else's head. And we may have emotions happening. And listening and emotion are almost inversely related. You know, if somebody's really, really upset, the best way to calm them down is to listen to them. And by the same token, if you're really upset or even really happy, it doesn't matter what strong emotion, it's much harder to listen than it is if you're in a kind of serene state. So all of those things are filters. And what that means is that your listening, George and mine, change through the day because we're in different situations. We have different stuff. Going. We may have just eaten. We may have, you know, I often uh, get given the graveyard slot when I'm speaking on stage. Oh, he's a TED speaker. He can deal with that. You know, the 2 p.m. just after lunch when everybody's a bit sleepy and not quite with it. So it changes through the day. And listening changes from person to person or group to group. So there's a wonderful question. And often I start this, this one when I'm dealing with uh, teaching listening skills to senior managers particularly. Uh, and uh, don't forget, listening tends to get more difficult as you get more senior. In an organization. We'll come back to that one in a minute. But when I'm teaching them, there's a question I teach them quite early on. And that question is what's the listening I'm speaking into? Asking that question of yourself just quietly, getting into the habit of asking that, whether it's one to one or you're on stage in front of a thousand, doesn't matter. The listening you're speaking into is unique to that moment and that audience. Ask yourself, what is it? And you become more and more sensitive to that. And that is the secret very often to missing, to hitting the bullseye with your speaking instead of missing the target altogether. Julian, that is uh, an intriguing question. What's the listening that I'm speaking into? And although I'm aware of adapting to your audience, that is even far more tuned to adapting to the, the mindset of them now, not their average mindset, but right now in this moment, how are they listening? And uh, an, another good reminder that when we're highly emotional, we we don't tend to listen well at all. Mm, so and, true, and, and which is which is why I suppose angry arguments go the way they do because people are simply making noise and neither one is listening. And yet, if one of them stopped to listen, mm, imagine what that could do. Very much so. And of course, when you stop to listen, I mean, this is why I've, I've, I've done, I did a TEDx talk in Athens, the cradle of democracy, uh, where I said, the sound of democracy is listening. Because listening is the doorway to understanding. All the conscious listening always creates understanding simply by listening carefully to somebody without batting back their their opinions or whatever it might be without judging them without you know preparing our next bit of absolute demolition of their stupid point of view whatever it might be if we're just listening to them we gain access to understanding and that's how we can live next door to somebody with whom we fundamentally disagree and i teach a, a tool also um, when i'm coaching people the tool is rv sec R-V-S-E-C. And the V in that, I think, is the single most important missing element in the modern world. 
So the R stands for reflect. You're listening to somebody, you reflect back what they said without hopefully paraphrasing it too much, but certainly to get exactly what they said. If you reflect that back, then the person knows they've been heard and you've, you've you know, uh, got to base camp of communication there. The V, as I said, is critical and it's the thing that's missing and being undermined daily by the internet, in particular social media, uh, and the way people are behaving. The V is validate. And what that sounds like is, George, I don't agree with you, but I totally understand why you would think that. Well, okay, we've got two different points of view, but I'm not making you wrong. I'm not dismissing you. Invalidation is what we see all over the world now on the internet with polarization, with people shouting at each other, with people making up stuff, caricaturing, demonizing, all of that stuff. There's no effort to understand the other point of view. It's kind of a zero sum game. I'm right, you're wrong. If I'm right, you're wrong. If, if you're right, I must be wrong. No, actually two people can have different views and both be right. How about mm. that one? Mm. Because they have different perspectives, different histories, and so forth. And let me just give you the SEC of the, of the process. So it's reflect, validate. The S is summarize. So let's just summarize where we've got to with this, which is great for closing doors in the long corridor of a conversation, you know, locking things down. The E is empathize. Well, that must have been really tough for you. Or, oh, amazing. I really, you, you must have felt great at that. Just being on the other person's island, island letting yourself feel their feelings a bit. When you've done those, you're in a position to get to the C, which is create, where you can put the two opposing views perhaps on the table in front of you and say, all right, what can we create with our two different perspectives here? The Greeks used to have thesis, antithesis, and you'd bring them together in synthesis. And that to me is how democracy can work, how politics can work, how family relationships can work, all based around this increased tolerance, which comes from listening. And I believe that it's important to go through the whole process, not just get part way and stop, reflect, validate, summarize, emphasize, and create. Because if you don't get to the create, you haven't really wrapped anything up. Well, that's yes. If you're if you're seeking to resolve a conflict, for example, it is that is really important. Uh, simply to reflect and validate, though, is a very good way of improving your relationships with people, uh, because people feel kind of cared about. They feel understood. It's said that we want three things in relationship: to be heard, to be understood, and to be valued. Mm -hmm. And I think the R and V achieve both of those two things. So. If you, if you want to achieve something creative or make a solution or get to a different place, then certainly the SEC um, are critical too. Uh, but, you know, if I had one wish, I think, in the world, it would be to give everybody the gift of validation so that we stop all this shouting at other people, demonizing people, hating people. And that's a slippery slope that we're on right now. And, you know, the bottom of that slope is disagree with me, I'll kill you which is, you know, we've just seen an attempt uh, about that in America. And it's not the way that we can have a stable dem democracy. It's, it's, a, it's a solution which is going to beget more and more conflict and fighting and war. And, and that's not a world I want my children growing up in. Mm. And, and validation, could, could that sound like, could it sound like this? I, I hear what you say. I appreciate your perspective and I see it differently. Is, is, that, is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. Because if you understand, if I say, George, I do understand what you're saying and I see why you believe that, would you entertain my point, my perspective, which is different? Then, you know, I haven't made you wrong. You, have, you don't have the defenses up. If I say, George, that's absolute rubbish. Listen, let me, let me tell you how it really is you immediately have got all your defenses up and you're not going to entertain my point of view with any kind of um, welcome whatsoever. So yes, absolutely. That is how validation can work. 
and and yes, I see so many examples of of disputing of totally putting a person down. I, I here's a phrase that has jumped out at to me. I was reading a, a a political discussion, and the phrase was, "Well, anybody with half a brain, <laughs> really." <laughs> I mean, that's just not helpful, is it? It's an, you know, insulting somebody with whom you're debating it doesn't move anything forward. Uh, this is the, you know, it, it's a human tendency to want to be right. Uh, and the other big one I talk about is, is the tendency to want to look good. So if those two things are involved in our communication, you know, I want to be better than you, I want to look better than you, I want people to be more impressed with me. Uh, Harville Hendricks, the American author and counselor, said a wonderful thing. He said, you can either be right or be in a relationship and you can't cuddle up with being right at the end of the day. Well, I think there's so much truth in that. Uh, so if we can just let go of this obsession that we have about being right, it would be a much more harmonious world. You know, where in science, there are no facts in science. There are only currently not disproved theories. The best currently not disproved explanation for some phenomena. And scientists spend all their time trying to disprove them and find a better one. Well, if we held on to our opinions as lightly as that, how different would the world be? Or to put it around the other way, if scientists grimly held on to explanations in the way that we hold on to our opinions, I don't think science would move forward very fast at all, would it? We, so, we'd still be thinking we're living on a flat earth. Certainly, we would. Mm. Julian, you mentioned earlier something that intrigued me, and that was that, as you said, as you become more senior in leadership and management, listening is more difficult? Yeah, it is. There are a lot of reasons for that. First of all, listening requires a great deal of humility. And humility is not something that really accelerates as you get more senior in an organization, is it? It's rather the inverse of that. Pride or perhaps status, power, um, looking good becomes more and more important. You don't want to look like you don't know. And leaders are supposed to know, aren't they? They're supposed to know us, know, know and tell us uh, what is going on, not ask, uh, not, you know, be querulous or um, or have their opinions um, easily moved by what people say. We like to have strong demonstrative leaders. Well, you know, that's dangerous as well. Um, and, you know, I think Susan Cain's TED talk about the power of introverts shows that leaders don't have to be shouty and table thumping and highly opinionated, dogmatic. That kind of leadership is what we see in societies where perhaps we wouldn't want to live. Uh, whereas in democracy, again, it's very important to entertain opposition. You know, Barack Obama said a great thing. He said, I will listen to you, especially if we disagree. Well, there's not a lot of that going on at the moment, unfortunately, and certainly not in autocracies. So, yes, I think as you get more senior, it is, it, it is the tendency to um, have an ego that grows perhaps, uh, to expect people to be um, obedient and get told. Um, it, it, the two-way street becomes rather more of a one-way street as you get more and more senior. And of course, that's difficult. If you want to create a listening organization, it has to come from the top. I have worked in organizations, I don't know if you have, George, many people listening to this probably have. I've worked in organizations where the leader was that kind of shouty, autocratic, uh, doesn't want any bad news. Just tell me the just tell me the solutions. Get on with it, you know. And uh, doesn't do a lot of praising people either. And that kind of scary autocratic leadership is enormously damaging to organisations. I mean, in fact, in the organisation I worked in, uh, people got to the point where they wouldn't take bad news to this person because the person was so scary. And they started inventing good news and hiding bad news. And the result was that the organization had to restate its accounts for three years and the share price got absolutely trashed. So it doesn't work very well not to listen to people in that way, not to listen to everything. It is our primary warning sense. You know, if squirrels didn't listen to scary sounds because they didn't like them, they wouldn't be around. 
And just in the same way, you know, if we're leading an organization, we need to listen to the stuff that perhaps we find difficult. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot um, about having a lot of variety in organizations, about the importance of diversity. Well, of course it's important, but there's another kind of diversity that's equally important and often ignored, which is diversity of opinion or perspective. Uh, it's critical not to surround ourselves if we're leaders with people who agree with us or people we like and we find easy to get on with who are like us, in other words, because you're just cloning yourself in that way and you get something that's quite ossified. You get something that's not very resilient to change because it only knows one way of doing things. So I've always enjoyed, you know, when I've been on boards or management groups, there's always somebody who's going, hang on. And everybody goes, oh, it's them again. You know, don't bother us with all this detail about how we can't do this. But they're right. And you can't. <laughs> and you need to listen sometimes. Julian, I'm um, when it comes to welcoming diverse uh, opinions, um, I can't speak from experience working for an organization like that. My best example comes from um, Star Trek Next Generation, Jean-Luc Picard. And I always admired when there was a crisis, he would speak to his officers and he said, options, options. And he wanted diverse opinions and he'd pick one and go with that without and never tell someone, well, that's a stupid idea or that's wrong. But he want he wanted diverse opinions. He didn't want everyone saying, yeah, well, I agree with him. I agree with him. I agree with him. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, the great leader will make decisions and accept the consequences of those decisions clearly. So that's that's a powerful leader. But consulting to have different options is a wonderful way to, to be. And it makes you much more flexible. Uh, just telling people and pretending you know everything. I mean, we've all met people whose favorite phrase is, I know, I know, you know, professionally unimpressible people. Well, if you know everything, you don't learn much, unfortunately. So, yes, I agree with you. I think uh, that's, yeah, it's a terrific role model. Um, so let's make it so. Mm, you got it. <laughs> uh, what are, what are the symptoms? of an organization where listening isn't a practice and encouraged skill? Well, you get a lot of frustration and resentment building up as people perhaps who've got good ideas about way, ways to improve things don't have a channel to express those ideas or they get knocked back or told they're being stupid or, you know, you know just get on with what you're doing, um, that kind of thing. So you're locking down a huge amount of valuable creativity and that can be enormously damaging enormously damaging i mean there's no there's no rule that says um, only the top people at the top of an organization have good ideas it could be that somebody who's working on a production line somewhere has an idea that could save millions and millions if only somebody would listen to them so there are no channels for that communication I wonder how many organizations uh, where, you know, the managers are listening to this, how many of you have got, for example, review processes, 360 reviews or whatever, which ask the question, how good is this person at listening? I wonder how many of you reward people who are good at listening for being good at listening. It tends to be a skill which we recruit on. Most organizations will say, we, oh yeah, we want good listeners. And then the moment people come on board, we forget about it altogether. We don't train on it. We don't assess it. We don't remunerate for it. Uh, we don't promote good listeners necessarily. Uh, we tend to be more obsessed in, certainly in the West, we're more obsessed with extrovert people who can stand up and give a great presentation and be powerful and confident and all that stuff. Well, those are great cap capabilities to have, but they're not all that you need to be a good leader, definitely. So I think some of the great leaders in history have been great listeners, first and foremost, not shouty, powerful uh, presenters necessarily. Um, so, you, you know, when you think of organizations that have had 
huge fails. I don't know, Kodak. You know, people will always need cameras. We'll be fine. Mm, yeah, but not with filming them. You know, and they didn't see that coming. And the reason for that kind of um, intransigence is not listening. You know, I talk about I have in my in my talks. I often have a picture of a squirrel up there, and I say, look, this little guy, he's fast, he's strong, and he's quick. Uh, sorry, and he, and he's athletic. You know, he can get out of trouble. He's got all the physical capabilities, but the thing he's doing most of all, most of the time, is listening. He's listening for danger all the time. And if he wasn't listening, then those capabilities would be of no use to him at all. So being aware, listening to, for danger, listening for opportunity. And of course, in the middle of those two things, a very important thing to listen to, which is challenge. You know, once upon a time, the crowned heads of ancient kingdoms had jesters employed. And the jester's role was to make fun of the king. He, he or she was the only person who was allowed to make fun of the monarch. You know, the rest of them, you get beheaded. But um, I, I have a good friend, David Firth, who wrote a wonderful book years ago called The Corporate Fool. And his thesis was, organizations need to employ people who fulfill that role, who are allowed to make fun, to say, ah, well, what, a, what about this? Or you have you thought of this? And so forth. To be the voice of difference, to be um, you know, the, the, the thing that perhaps spoils a perfect plan when that plan was actually going to take the whole organization off the edge of a cliff. So these are important aspects of, of listening and organizations that don't do it very well tend to grind on and ignore the changes that are going on around them and they don't last that long and change as we know is accelerating all the time now. AI is putting another level of acceleration on that. So listening to what's going on, listening to the changes, listening to what your competitors are doing, what you know, aspirational organizations are doing, what your people may be doing that you don't know about. All of this is critical if you're going to make good decisions about the future. And Julian, I'm thinking that it it's probably more critical to be listening even more when there is change, when there is tough competition um, versus just, oh, everything's steady. We maybe don't need to listen as much, but we certainly do when there's change. And if we've got competition, especially if we don't know what that competition is yet. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So you're listening to all sorts of, in all sorts of directions, if you like, listening to your staff, your peers, you know, your managers, whoever it may be in up, down, sideways, inside the organization, critical listening to partners as well. The, the, any kind of stakeholders in the organization, it might be shareholders, it might be uh, suppliers or business partners, anybody who's invested in the organization or relies upon it listening to them as well, perhaps consultants, experts, gurus, whatever that may be, and listening inside as well to your conscience. I mean, uh, most organizations will have a North Star of some kind, uh, you know, a set of values or whatever that may be, and listening to that as well to try and make decisions which are pointing in the right direction for the organization, for its culture, its soul, if you like. Uh, so lots of people to listen to lots of directions to listen, shutting yourself off from these and uh, thinking that you know everything. You've got to be a bit of a genius to succeed like that. Um, and we're not all that way, I'm afraid. It's rather better to draw on a team of diverse opinions, diverse experiences. Um, and as you did, uh, as you mentioned with Jean-Luc Picard, you know, options. What do you all think about this? And then hopefully you'll get to a synthesis, which is very powerful. For people who'd like to learn more about my guest, Julian Treasure, and how he might work with your organization, you can check out his website at juliantreasure.com, and you can find that link in the description below. Julian, tell us quickly, how might you help an organization? 
Well, these days, uh, I spend a great deal of time traveling the world and doing keynote talks, uh, which are a very encapsulated form of training to me. Uh, so, yes, those are very powerful. I give them on speaking skills and on listening skills and also on sound, actually, the power of sound and how we can design with it for our well-being. Uh, so that's one aspect of it. Uh, then I also do workshops, uh, many of them now virtual. I live, as you said, off the north coast of Scotland. I love it here. So if I can do things without traveling with the wonderful technology we've got now, I have a studio equipped here. I can send excellent video and audio and uh, all sorts of um, bells and whistles on it. So, um, yeah, workshops for teams, one day, two day workshops, individual coaching and training for top executives, all of those things. You know, I am just passionate about spreading the, uh, the, the awareness and, and, and helping people to develop these skills of speaking and in particular listening. And it, it is so underappreciated, undervalued and undertrained on at the moment. So really, that's the mission I'm on. Mm. Julian, as we prepare to wrap up, if you could give advice to a, a new team leader in an organization where listening hasn't been the rule, hasn't been the standard, but a new leader who wants to introduce better listening, what one, two, or three pieces of advice might you give that person on how to introduce it so that they can succeed? Well, first of all, it comes from the top. So that person needs to be a good listener, to train and to be an excellent listener. It's like anything else, saying to people, you know, sending an email around saying tomorrow we're going to be a listening organization, that doesn't work very well. And if it's not coming from the top, people very quickly learn to shut up, unfortunately. So that's the first thing, is to be become a great listener yourself. Then I think structurally, you can take a look at the culture and behavior in the organization. You can take a look at the processes and channels that people have to communicate. Uh, and you can take a look at the, uh, as I said before, appraisal, remuneration, the ways that you're treating people and the, the, the messages that you're giving to people. Once you've put in place some channels, once you've got the appraisal and remuneration system altered, and once you've assessed the culture and the behavior, you can start training. And that's the way to do it, is to work with people, show them the benefits of great listening, whether it's in meetings, which can be shorter, sharper, and more effective, one-to-one uh, -one conversations, uh, you know, you need to look also at your environments. I mean, are the offices too noisy for people to listen well? Do you have quiet working space? Do you have effective meeting spaces? All these sorts of things you can pay attention to. They're all elements in a program of turning an organization into an excellent listening organization, opening all of those flows of really good ideas, of passion, of, uh, you know, motivating people in in giving them the ability to affect the organization, how it behaves. I'll give you one, one simple example of how this can play out, George, just to finish with. Think of customer service or in, indeed complaint handling, right? So maybe you have a call center, which is fielding a lot of customer feedback, and that will often be complaints about where something's gone wrong or whatever it may be. Well, my experience, and I'm sure most people listening to this, is when you call one of those places, you get somebody whose real task is to get you off the phone as quickly as possible by fobbing you off with some sort of, you know, have free, have some free miles or, you know, we'll give you a discount next time or to make it right as quickly as possible. Do they ever ask the question, hmm, is this something we could actually change in our organization? You know, and I've actually tried to make suggestions about that to people in the past, but you know that it's a dead end. They have no mechanism behind them to say, here's a great suggestion. Why don't we feed that back up the line and see if we could do things differently in the future and therefore not have any more of this kind of complaint. But that's not generally how it works. They have a thing called time to clear. They're judged on how fast they get through the calls. And that's not about asking that question. And there 
sadly, we see millions and millions and millions of dollars of great ideas disappearing, stillborn, never getting anywhere where they can do any good. So that's the kind of listening I'm talking about. It needs to be in every cell of an organization that we're listening for opportunity. We're listening for danger. We're listening for challenge. Uh, if you get that right, wow, what an organization you can have. Mm, yeah, it's no good to say, oh, well, that's not me. You got to go talk to the person in charge of listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't have that either. <laughs> My guest today is Julian Treasure, reminding you that listening is a skill that can be learned, can be practiced, can be improved. If you like what you heard, tell your friends and post your five-star review on Apple Podcasts because that helps more listeners find us. Come back every week for more practical insights to help you deliver your intended message. I'm your host, George Torok. <music>